Today we're going to be talking about uh, this. I'm going to introduce you to Christian. Make sure everybody's muted really quick. Great. <laughs> Better. All right. So today I'll introduce you to Nietzsche, and then afterwards we'll have some brief moment for the Martin Luther King discussion. Um, actually, before I forget, I was thinking that if some of you wanted to stay longer last time and discuss, like you were in the middle of your discussion. So I thought if you want to, you can just stay on when I. Oh, it's not possible. That's right. When I close the breakout rooms, everyone has to come back. Okay, never mind. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, all right, let me start with Nietzsche. So this is the outline of today's lecture. First, I'm going to talk about uh, modernity. Uh, then I'm going to talk about his biography. And then we'll talk about his philosophy. philosophy and two points I'm going to make there. Number one, his critique of religion. And number two, the, number two, the creation of values. Okay, so that's the plan for today. All right, um, so we're now moving away from the Middle Ages. We're also moving north, <laughs> right? We were kind of in the golden age of Islam for, for a few hundred years <laughs> for the past few weeks. But now we're going to move north to Germany. And also we're going to move in time. We're entering the 19th century with Nietzsche. Um, yeah, uh, he was born actually uh, in 1844. So 19th century, mid 19th century. Uh, and we're also shifting in terms of the worldview with regards to religion, right? If you recall, uh, Maimonides and Rumi are still very religious, right? Even though they emphasize, you know, at least Maimonides <laughs> emphasized rationality, critical mindset. A lot of the Muslim scholars also did so, right? Rumi was also very much open to philosophy, to other, to Christianity, right? Even though you had a little bit of, um, you know, room uh, given to the human initiative, the human uh, rationality, it was mostly a religious uh, context, right? Everyone took it for granted that God existed. Nobody was <laughs> putting that into question, right? They were putting into question how to read the scripture or how to, you know, think through an interpretation, but nobody was putting into question the foundation of religion, uh, such as the existence of God. Now Nietzsche is entering a, a world and an era where this is going to start to become the norm, right? Um, the, the doubt with regards to whether there is even a God starts already in the Renaissance, right? But it's building up and in the 19th century is the culmination, right? So, so this is really one of the uh, characteristics of modernity, right? You have really a shift from a religious to a secular worldview. Okay, so make sure you write this down that the main, uh, uh, the, the, the main characteristic of modernity, modernity which is between the 18th to the 20th century, we are now in post-modernity and that's a whole other story, but modernity was characterized by the shift from the religious to uh, the rational secular worldview. Today in postmodernity, anything goes. We have all kinds of worldviews <laughs> and all kinds of superstitions, right? We, we have a resurgence of the religious um, alongside a, a very highly uh, um, high respect for science. So we have a kind of a blend <laughs> now of both, um, both cultures, right? But, but in modernity, you really had a shedding of the religious for the secular. And there were two main reasons for that, actually. Um, the main one had to do with the rise of science, right? With the rise of science, we realize, huh, we don't need to pray to God to save us anymore. We can do this, right? If there's a drought, we can conceive an elaborate system of irrigation. If there's a plague, we can come up with a vaccine, right? More and more, we realize that all of these ills that we thought were from the hand of God and that only God could resolve, we can do this ourselves, Right. With the proper use of our reason, we can begin to resolve the problems of the world without having to accumulate and, and uh, prayers, right, and, and begging God to help us, right? So, so the, the, the Industrial Revolution really um, 
and the rise of science contributed a lot to this shift from the religious to the secular, right? We, God has become what we call a superfluous hypothesis, right? Let me write this down, superfluous hypothesis. In other words, we don't need him to, uh, he doesn't need, we don't need him in the equation. <laughs> we can do this on our own, right? So that's kind of the first uh, reason, right? Why we shift from a religious to a secular uh, my, uh, worldview. Second reason is a kind of weariness with all of the religious wars and bloodshed that took place on the European soil. Um, as you know, right, I hinted uh, to it when I was talking about the golden age of Islam, but you have, first of all, the persecutions of the church with the Inquisition, then you had a number of wars, uh, religiously inspired and, and just Europe was tired. <laughs> Europe was sick and tired of religious wars and bloodshed and persecution and so they just wanted out, right? In addition, of course, to the obscurantism and the abuses of the church, right? You, you're familiar certainly with the system where um, they would oppress the poor by telling them if you give us money, the money you don't have, <laughs> <laughs> you can buy your way to heaven, right? This was the system of the indulgences, right? Uh, where you, you would tell people, look, you sinned, but, you know, if you really want to be forgiven, you need to pay this amount of money and you're good, right? And if you want to ensure, right, <laughs> to be sure that, you know, you make it, it's like buying a ticket to heaven, basically, right? So there was the, all of this going on and people were just sick and tired. So there was really, and even now, if you go to, to Europe, especially France, who was really, France used to be called the second daughter of the church, right? Italy being the first one. But France today, you mentioned religion and you look like a complete creep, not even, not even a moron. You look like a creep, <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> right? So th there's really still in Western society, in Europe, not in the States, different story in the States, right? But in Europe, especially uh, in general, there was a distaste for religion, right? In addition to the fact that religion was proving to be useless. Anyways, we have science now. Right, so, so this is the climate of the age, right, that Nietzsche is born into. And of course, you have to expect that Nietzsche will be thinking also along those lines, right? And we'll talk about this. So um, this, this time of modernity has really been called the coming of age of humanity, right? Just like when you become a teenager, you come of age, you're at the age you can drive, you can, you know, drink, <laughs> you can do what you want, right? This is the time, right, in, 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 in European history where there was the childhood age where, you know, we were still under the, you know, the authority of the church, but now with modernity is the, is the teenage rebellion, right? Where we can do this, we don't need you, I don't need to listen to you, <laughs> right? I can do this on my own, I have my own opinion, right? This is the climate, right? Um, so we have also another uh, way that this, um, this epoch or this time has been uh, described is as a Copernican shift. Uh, so I'm not gonna ask too many questions today because I'm gonna finish quickly. <laughs> so Copernican shift, you all remember Copernicus, right? The guy who discovered that in, in, in we, we used to think that um, the sun revolved around the earth. And he discovers the opposite, actually, is <laughs> the earth that revolves around the sun. That was Copernicus, right? Let me write his name down. Um, and so it, it, in this time, we have similar complete reversal, right? We used to think that human beings revolve around God, right? But now, actually, it's the human beings are at the center, right? In, in the Middle Ages, we have one, one planetary system, and in modernity, we have another. So in the Middle Ages, we used to believe God is at the center and everything revolves around God. Now with modernity, Copernican shift, man is at the center and everything else revolves around the human being, right? Okay, get the idea. Okay, so Nietzsche, very similar view, right? In two ways, right? First of all, you will see Nietzsche, for those of you in the class who, who are kind of leaning towards atheism or agnosticism, you will love Nietzsche, right? Because uh, he's somebody who became an atheist. <laughs> Right. I mean, he's still you can still sense in his writings. He's a very deeply spiritual person, but he's certainly not a religious one. Right. He's he's actually really, even though he grew up in Christianity, like everybody else around him, he rejected it and then wrote almost everything he wrote against it. <laughs> right. So now we're really going to enter into 
one of the most, in my view, powerful critiques of religion. He focuses on Christianity, but it really cross, it goes across the board, right? So one of the most powerful critiques, but also one of the most sincere, authentic, and lucid critiques of especially Christianity, right? So we need to take Nietzsche very seriously, in my view, right? Even though his tone, you will see, is, it doesn't sound very serious. He's just, we'll talk about his tone in a second, Many are tempted to kind of, you know, just uh, push him away and say, oh, you know, he's just bitter or whatever. He's a hater, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, he is an extremely important uh, milestone, in my view, in the spiritual journey. Blaze, you have a question. Go ahead. Um, you said that Nietzsche is um, not religious, but spiritual. So how do we understand the spirituality of Nietzsche independent of religion? Within, within the, within this Judeo-Christian context. Yeah, so he's going to be spiritual, but not in a Judeo-Christian sense. He's going to be uh, uh, going back to the Greek, uh, 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 Greek uh, religious uh, or spiritual approaches. He talks a lot. We'll talk about one of his books where he talks about the two Greek gods, Dionysus and and uh, Apollo. Nietzsche wrote a lot about Dionysus. And towards the end of his life, he starts to merge Dionysus with Jesus, <laughs> right? So he has a kind of, he's intrigued, right? It's not like he has a practice. He's not, you know, doing yoga, right? He's not like that. But you can sense that there is something in him which is intrigued, curious, attracted to some kind of spirituality, but he's finding what fits him better in the Greek uh, spiritualities, right? Uh, and we'll see, especially the god Dionysus is, is, a, is a figure that intrigued Nietzsche, uh, as well as the figure of Jesus, which he finds uh, resembles Dionysus in many ways. So yeah, so in that sense, does that answer your question? Blitz? <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, so, so that's the first thing. So as I was saying, right, you, Nietzsche is, you cannot go around Nietzsche. He's fundamental in any spiritual journey that is serious, right? You will hit upon Nietzsche at one point. And to the degree that you allow yourself to be challenged by Nietzsche is the degree to which you will go deeper and, and, and actually graduate into what I would call what Levinas will call, will study Levinas, a religion for adults, right? So adult spirituality, in my view, is only possible by, by taking Nietzsche very seriously, accepting the challenge and, and responding. Not, no, it's not enough to just accept the challenge and be like, oh, you're right, <laughs> responding, right? So, so if, any, if any of you in the class, right, have a religious background, it will be, Nietzsche is difficult. If you have a religious background, you want, you want to punch him in the face, like, all day long, <laughs> right? But he is actually one of the most um, lucid and authentic criticisms, right? And, and he's in many ways right on, right? So um, it's very important to, to take him seriously, uh, hear him out, and also begin to respond. If one wants to get to an adult level, graduate from childhood level to adult level, uh, you cannot overlook Nietzsche, right? So, so you will see there, so that's the first thing, right? That Nietzsche has in common with the modernity, his hatred of religion. <laughs> Second thing that Nietzsche has in common is his individualism, right? Nietzsche is going to say, we need to actually move into a time where we discard all the old values and create new ones, right? So this is really uh, very interesting because basically what Nietzsche is saying is that if we get rid of Christianity, what we need to understand what that means. To get rid of Christianity is to basically get rid of our moral worldview, which has been inspired by Christianity. So he's speaking, of course, of Western countries, right? Including the United States. If you get rid of Christianity, you also get rid of thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and so forth, right? Because our moral, um, the, the whole moral edifice of our society, the whole moral system of our society actually built on Christianity. So if you're going to get rid of Christianity, that goes, <laughs> that goes with it, right? So then what? Can we kill? Can we, is, is, where are we, where are we going to be? Some, some, some of the anarchists in the class might be, you know, kind of having goosebumps right now, but, <laughs> but what, what, what we need to understand is that Nietzsche is saying, yes, we need to realize the consequences. If we're going to be truly secular, we need to also get rid of all of the 
contributions of Christianity. Anything that is tainted by Christianity has to go. So that means we get rid of the old system of values and now what? And what Nietzsche is saying, well, we can't just stay in limbo. We need to create new values for post-Christian world. Okay, so, so he's going to actually talk about that. We're gonna, uh, not, not, he doesn't talk about it uh, too much, but it, I, will, I will talk about it. <laughs> Based on one of his books, it is possible to, to, uh, to catch a glimpse of what he was thinking about, right? So, so two things, right? Discard religion and build something new instead, right? So this is actually, um, Nietzsche is very, really Nietzsche is kind of like standing at the helm of a ship, you know, and you feel the wind and you don't know, you know, it's the unknown. And that's really how it feels to read Nietzsche. Like anything could happen at this point, right? We can rebuild the foundations of society. We can destroy the old worldview and create something new that works better, right? So that's kind of the... Um, the atmosphere okay so all right so very much in line with modernity which is also forward-looking shedding the past building something new that's really so that in that sense Nietzsche is a modern right in those two senses okay let's go a little bit to his biography I'm gonna put the dates for once I have the death uh, 1844 to 1900 and uh, he's German so he was born in, uh, it doesn't say, okay, <laughs> Germany. <laughs> and uh, actually, he started out studying music. He was actually pretty good at music. He actually, he was a pianist and he composed a little bit, but actually, uh, when you actually play some of his compositions, they're not that good. <laughs> He's not that good. Uh, he's, he's better as a philosopher. But he was kind of writing in this, I mean, composing in the style of Liszt. Uh, if, if anybody knows, he's a famous uh, pianist from, German pianist from the time. So he, um, so he uh, starts his university studies and he double majors uh, in the beginning in both theology and, and uh, not philosophy, but classical languages. Classical languages, that means Greek and Latin, right? So he's going into Greek and Latin language and literature. And then he's doing theology. Uh, um, those are his two majors, right? Now, after the first year, he comes across a book, which was very controversial, called The Life of Jesus by David Strauss. And this book was so controversial. This was one of those books that got so many negative reviews um, because it was so controversial. And in essence, what the book was arguing was that, okay, Jesus might have been historical figure, but all of these stories around his persona, the miracles, the walking on water, the changing, you know, water into wine, all of this, the book says, were complete invention to attract more followers. So actually the book was arguing, Jesus was a very ordinary person, had a few things to say, but all the other stuff was a complete creation of the writers to make Jesus look kind of mythical and, and uh, godly, right, divine. And then that would create more uh, tra traction, well, more, it would attract more uh, the believers. And of course, this is coming from a very modern perspective, right? That reason is the only thing that exists, right? Remember, modernity sheds anything, not only religion, but anything that is supernatural, anything that is mysterious, anything that has no explanation, we're done. That doesn't exist. So this book is typically modern, right? When it says that, oh, we can only accept as true that which fits the categories of reason. If it doesn't fit the category of reason, it can't exist. It can't be true, right? Um, you can already imagine what Rumi would say on this. Well, uh, of course, Maimonides would be happy, <laughs> but uh, Rumi, of course, would say, well, of course, yes, but you're missing a whole dimension, <laughs> right? So, uh, so yeah, so Nietzsche read the book and he was convinced. He thought this is a well put argument and this completely destroyed his, the, the last bits, crumbs of faith he had left in him. It wasn't very strong, clearly. And that just did away with whatever was left of Christianity and Nietzsche. And from that day on, he became the most, vocal critic of Christianity right okay so so anyway so he drops his theology major and he opts simply for the classical languages and literature um, he becomes a professor um, he moves to Switzerland and then you have a war in 1870s so let me write the dates not that it doesn't matter actually <laughs> uh, in 1870 he's how old is he he's like 36, I think. <laughs> no, I don't know. 
<laughs> I, I can't, I cannot do math. I, I had a math teacher who, who, she just took it out of me. Um, anyways, we all had teachers like that who, instead of developing the skill, like squashed it. <laughs> so clearly, if someone can tell me his age at uh, 1870, he was born in 44. Thank you, 26, Bella. All right, <laughs> 26. Why, I don't know why I was thinking along the 40. So he's 26 years old. He's drafted because he's of age. He's drafted into the army. And there is just a disaster, right? He, he has, I mean, you know, the, the, the life of a soldier is, is, is a complete mess. So he contracts all kinds of diseases, diphtheria, dysentery, syphilis, all kinds of things. And including, he, he leaves the army with also a deep hatred for any type of nationalism, right? Uh, anyone who associates Nietzsche with Nazism, as has been done, right? Because it's true, some elements of his philosophy resonate with, with what Hitler was trying to do. Um, it's, it's, it's somewhat misguided because Nietzsche really hated nationalism. He hated herd, what he called the herd mentality, right? The mentality of, of groups, right? When groups get together, Nietzsche would just run. <laughs> it, was, it was offensive to him, right? As soon as you have a big group of people thinking the same thing, doing the same thing, that was just like he, he, he would develop boils, right? So, so he really has this deep-seated hatred of, of German nationalism and also, interestingly, of anti-Semitism. He really, he would make fun of people who were anti-Semitic. He had actually um, a sister who was married to a very prominent anti-Semitic man and they were living in South America somewhere. They had founded a colony, actually, of, of Germans there. And he would just each time he would see them, he would make fun of them, right? So, so, um, so yeah, so just saying these things to clarify a little bit um, the later role that would be given to him. I mean, Hitler actually distributed his works to his army, right? Kind of making Nietzsche the poster child of his um, message, but it, it really does not fit with the man himself, right? Who hates the herd, who's finds anti-Semitism ridiculous, uh, and so forth. So anyways, 1872, uh, he writes, uh, in my view, one of his most important books called The Birth of Tragedy. So, um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about The Birth of Tragedy, even though it's not um, the book we'll be reading, because if you understand that book, you can actually come to understand very well later on when we'll study the creation of values, right? If you want to understand the creation of values, you have to understand what Nietzsche means by creation or by art, right? Because what Nietzsche is suggesting is we need to, it, it needs to be like art. We need to create something new, new values. So this is an artistic endeavor. It's creative. So to understand what he's going to say later on in terms of creating new values for society, you have to understand his views on art and the birth of tragedy are his views on art more specifically on uh, theater, on the tragedies that were written by the, uh, the Greeks and the, the Romans. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. According to, to Nietzsche, a good work of art, so I want you to think, as I'm talking, I want you to think any one of you, actually, let me just get um, the gallery view, see if you're still there. <laughs> I don't see you when I'm talking, so I don't know, maybe you can all walk out and I'll be talking by myself. Uh, <laughs> So he's, uh, I want to know how many of you do dabble a little bit in like poetry or music or you've composed something of your own. Uh, anybody? Okay, so one, that's it. Just one artist in the class. Um, okay, great. <laughs> There's only one person going to understand what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Segal. <laughs> Very good. Yes, so a few of you have created. Now, to have a, a good creation, said Nietzsche, you need there to be two forces at work. There needs to be two sources of inspiration, right? Two, two forces are at work in any good work of art. And he named these two forces um, after two Greek gods, Apollo and Dionysus. So let's talk a little bit about Apollo, which I don't know how to spell. Um, clearly, you can spell it wrong in your test too. Thank you, two L's and one, okay, the opposite. Is that what I did? No, it's the opposite. Okay, Apollo. Thank you. Very good. Uh, so yes, we will follow Rodriguez on this. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the god Apollo. Does anybody know what this god represents? What is he the god of? Um, I think he was the god of uh, like arts, like poetry. 
Yes, he's the god of rhythm, therefore poetry. He's the god of harmony, therefore music, and also medicine, right? So he's the god of order, right? Apollo, let me write it down, right? Apollo with one P. God of order, right? Order, harmony, rhythm, and therefore, right, by extension, music, uh, art, and uh, medicine, right? Remember that medicine in the Greek context has to do with the balance of opposite forces, like in Chinese medicine, right? So harmony, again, right? Balance. So that's Apollo, right? Order, rhythm, harmony. Dionysus, what is he the god of? Of uh, merriment, wine, yes. right? Yes. Party. <laughs> Very good. Chaos, really. Very good. God of chaos, the opposite, right? Chaos, wine, uh, orgies, uh, intoxication, parties, right? Parties like Job's children were doing, certainly, right? Okay, so you have two opposite gods, right? One is the god of you know, harmony structure. The other one is the god of right, explosion, eruption, no limits, no boundaries. What Nietzsche is saying is that when you want to have a good work of art, you need both forces at work. In other words, you, yes, you need order. You need to be able, when you write a poem, to have a rhythm with music, to have some kind of, you know, coherence. But you also need the wildness of inspiration. In other words, you can't just sit and decide, I'm going to write something in order. You have to receive this powerful possession by an idea. Any genuine artist, is first of all possessed and then they put it into order, right? No artist is gonna sit and be like writing without having first an idea, right? So the idea part, the, the, the possession part by an idea, an idea that you, you, you couldn't come out of you, it, just, it came to you, right? Most artists will tell you, this thing came to me, right? In a dream or in a moment of inspiration. So this is the Dionysus moment, right? Ah, it came to me possession by an idea you're you're about to erupt with this idea and then you have to of course put it into some kind of medium right Har a rhythm or a harmony or you know you need to arrange it so that it has a coherence and that's the second that's apollo right so any work of art you need both if you just have apollo actually let me there are some uh, musicians like this, right? I, I used to, to study music, so, um, so I was listening to a lot of performers. And there's two kinds of performers out there, at least when you're first learning, right? You have a performer technically immaculate, perfect technique. You want to kill them, <laughs> right? But there's nothing. They're, they're not saying anything, right? Pure Apollo. And then you have the others. Pure passion, they're so passionate and they're playing and they're like, you know, making lots of fit, but they're making all kinds of mistakes too. They're like, you know, sloppy, out of tune, but you can sense the passion. Pure Dionysus, the ideal is together, the two. Have the perfect technique with the powerful inspiration and message that you want to transmit through the medium of the composition or the instrument, right? So. This will, we'll come back to this idea when we talk about the creation of values, because this will be the path forward for Nietzsche. This, the, the, this principle of allying Dionysos and Apollo, we'll see how, will work also when it comes to moral creation, right? The creation of values. Okay, so let's continue with this philosophy. In 1879, now is like a few years, he's maybe in his 30s, I guess, based on Bella's calculations. <laughs> His health begins to deteriorate, right? Because of all these things he has contracted during the, the war. Um, he begins to travel because it's well known that if you go to Italy, you'll get better. <laughs> uh, people believe that because the air in Italy was just, you know, amazing and the light also. So he would go there a lot and he did, stopped teaching, couldn't teach anymore, he was too sick. And he just begins to write a lot. And actually it is during this time of sickness that he ends up writing most of his works, including the one that we're gonna study. Um, so yeah, um, so the, the last work I think was, um, 
Oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So let's go now a little bit into his philosophy. So I can already introduce you to these two main points I mentioned, the critique of Judeo, uh, what did I say? Critique of religion? Yeah. So the critique of Judeo-Christian values, right? Mostly Christianity he's criticizing actually, because that's the religion he's in. And then we'll talk a little bit about the creation of values. So First of all, uh, we need to understand Nietzsche in one sentence, uh, and you'll get a sense of who he is. There's a very famous quote, which talks about uh, his, his, uh, the way that he has abandoned religion, right? The, the, it talks about, it's, it's, it's the moment of the rejection of religion, but for him, it was a joyous moment. It was a joyful moment, the moment that he found that he, he didn't have any more the shackles of religion. And so he says this, God is dead. I'm writing it down, right? God is dead. The sea, meaning the ocean, right? The open sea lies before us. Okay, this is a famous quote by Nietzsche. Ah, yes, blades. Yes, God is dead and we killed him. That's another one. Very good. <laughs> right? So he's, in a way, uh, I, you know, many people have misunderstood the statement. They're like, oh, you know, he wants to kill God. <laughs> That's not the case, right? Nietzsche is prophesied, right? Nietzsche is saying, in the time we live in today, God is dead, right? We and we have killed him, yes, right? In, 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 with the rise of science, with the um, weariness with religion, right? Modernity, God is already dead, right? So he's not saying we should kill God, right? Nietzsche is not a God killer, right? He's just stating a fact. He's observing God is dead. But for him, this is good news because immediately after acknowledging the death of God, he, it's kind of like almost a joyous outburst. He says, the sea, the open sea lies before us. Ah, <sighs> freedom right now why is he saying that what does it mean what kind of freedom are we talking about why does he give us this image what does it mean that the open sea lies before us now that finally god is dead what does it mean um he's no longer constrained by uh by religion or its moral principles he can begin to create a new system or new methodology of thinking excellent right we are no more in the straitjacket of religion all of these rules that were imposed on us all of these scary stories right that we were told is all gone we've woken up from this nightmare it's like we went through a big nightmare where we were followed by demons and hell was waiting and we had all this big burden of things we couldn't do <laughs> all gone right? This is the feeling of someone who has thrown off the shackles of religion, all of these rules, all of these, you know, threats, <laughs> gone, right? Uh, a few of you also, Simone, right? The world is ours. And uh, yes, Cancino, excellent. Exploration is limitless. In other words, Christianity for too long has determined what we should be as human beings, how we should live, right? What is our destiny? What is our fate? Now, finally, we can choose our own path. We don't have the script anymore. We threw the script away, <laughs> right? Now we can write our own script, right? We don't need to be following into this narrow path, right? Uh, we can actually create a new reality, create a new version of what it means to be human, create a new future for the human race. It, the, the, it's, uh, the possibilities are endless. This is the climate, right? Uh, right after the death of God. Um, so, so this is right. So, so of course, Nietzsche is, is, is overjoyed. <laughs> and so the first part of his work is really about showing uh, the danger of Christianity, right? He, he, he basically says Christianity is a dangerous religion that we need to shed if we're going to move forward as a civilization. So there are two main reasons, right, why he thinks Christianity is dangerous. Number one, I'll talk about it in a second, he thinks it is nihilistic. And number two, he thinks it's illusional. So these are the two main um, criticisms, right? So let's talk briefly about each one. And we'll come back to this, of course, when we do the text. But nihilistic comes from the Latin nihil, which means uh, nothingness, and which kind of alludes to death or, you know, um, oblivion, right? In other words, nihilistic means that it's focused on death, right? So when he says Christianity is a nihilistic religion focused on death, 
what do you think he means? How is Christianity focused on death? <laughs> what do you think? Those who know about Christianity, who had it shoved down their throat. <laughs> what does it mean that Christianity is a religion of death? What do you think? Well, it's always talking about the afterlife, right? Well, we're going to receive, you know, we behave certain ways and then we follow certain things. We're going to be rewarded, not here, but in the afterlife. Okay, so you're already hitting on the second point, which is delusional, right? So yes, let's start, let's start with this one then, right? Delusional in the sense that this life doesn't matter. Even if your life is decrepit here, it doesn't matter because there's an afterlife and that's what matters. That's what you should live for, right? So that for Nietzsche is creating a big alternative reality, which we have no evidence exists. It's a negation of life. So in that sense, yes, it's nihilistic. And then it's the delusion of another life. I think that summarizes it very well. So you guys can jot down, right? On the one hand, it's a negation of life here and now because that life for Christianity doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're poor, if you die, if you're crippled for life. It doesn't matter because ultimately what really matters is the afterlife and that, says Nietzsche, is the delusional moment, <laughs> right? So both nihilistic, doesn't appreciate life as it is, and delusional. How else? How else would you describe Christianity as falling into the trap of being nihilistic and delusional? Uh, any other comments? This is a good group therapy for all of those who went to Catholic school. <laughs> Me included. Um, I actually, I, ha I like went to Catholic school for a little bit, and um, like while I was there, like they kind of just preached to like, if you like disobey God, like you're basically going to hell and stuff like that. So it's just like a very kind of like negative view if you're sinning or anything like that. So it's pretty much like, like you can't explore anything like that because everything's going to be a sin. Okay, very good. Right. This, this other view where like, like we saw with Job, right? The, the life being seen suspiciously, right? There is a suspicion, a distrust of life. There is a distrust of entering. There is a fear of truly entering life, a fear of making mistakes, which was exactly Job's fear, right? Uh, a fear of sin. And so people don't live, <laughs> right? They, there, there's a list of to-dos and to, and to don'ts, right? And there's really, in a way, life is never truly embraced and entered and celebrated and loved because life becomes this dark place full of sin, right? So this is another way that Christianity can become nihilistic, right? By this kind of hatred of what it means to be human, right? Very good, uh, Cancino. Anybody else? <clears throat> Let's see, let me get my gallery view. You good? That's it? Okay. Uh, any, uh, does anybody see uh, how Nietzsche's criticism might uh, also uh, uh, target Islam or Judaism? Anybody see elements of what Nietzsche is saying with regards to those other religions or religion in general? Uh, he's targeting Christianity, but does it apply to other religions or not? What do you think? Uh, I, I feel like it does because, I mean, a lot of religions follow kind of the same basic, you know, layout where it's like, you know, believe in God, do this, this is what he thinks is right. Um, and then, you know, following things to be rewarded at another time. Okay, very good, right? There is always a kind of fear that is instilled in us when we have some kind of religious background, a fear of certain aspects of life shouldn't be experienced, right? So again, this might, this can fall under the category of being nihilistic in the sense that, okay, well, there is certain certain moments in life, certain experiences of life are considered to be evil, right? So there again, life is seen as something that we need to distrust as a dark, dreary place that is very dangerous, like a back alley. And <laughs> we need to either avoid or go in, you know, like this. <laughs> so yeah, so that's really this, the way, and this is really what Nietzsche is saying, that this, this uh, teaching which is based on fear of life right fear of making mistakes fear of going through certain experiences that's what it means in many ways to be nihilistic the fear of life right fear of living fear of suffering fear of sinning fear of making mistakes these are all symptoms of the same fear of life itself which by the way job also was struggling with right so 
Okay, excellent. So we'll see a little more on that, of course, when we get to the, uh, to the text. So then we get, of course, Nietzsche is not going to leave us hanging, right? Once that we've, you know, completely dismantled Christianity, he will, even though he does sound very, you know, he's all about destruction. Nietzsche, sometimes I get the cartoon image of Nietzsche, like you have a child building a nice castle and then Nietzsche comes and just, you know, you know how you kick, <laughs> destroy the sand castle and have so much fun doing so. Nietzsche does appear to be like that, right? Just enjoying the destruction. Uh, but he does actually, if you read uh, more broadly, right, his work, you do get the sense that he's giving us the tools to build something new. And we'll talk about that, of course, right? The creation of values and how he proposes to move forward, right, once everything has been dismantled. Okay, let's talk briefly about the way he writes, um, because I need to warn, we need to have like a warning, like, you know, like, um, you know, those rap songs that have like a warning, what's that called? Um, they don't have those warnings anymore, do they? Do they? Explicit lyrics, disclaimer. <laughs> a disclaimer? What's a disclaimer? No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> What's that, Kirsten Bell? A disclaimer, like, especially on rap albums, warns the listener that there's going to be explicit content. Yeah, that's it, a disclaimer. Okay, so I'm going to do a disclaimer for Nietzsche right now for a few minutes <laughs> because it, it is going to be pretty a rough ride for some of us, right? It's, it, Nietzsche is, is not easy. It's easy to understand, but it's not easy to swallow. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about that. But you will notice, first of all, uh, first of all, first thing I would advise before you read Nietzsche, it's very important. One thing you need to do is develop a sense of humor. <laughs> if you don't have one yet, get one because that's the only way, right? You can't really, if you don't have a sense of humor, you're just going to go around feeling offended, <laughs> right? You need to see Nietzsche kind of like a stand up comedian. Uh, let me get a, an idea of how many of you watch stand up comedy, like, like, you know, Dave Chappelle or Kevin Hart, those guys, right? Uh, who are always saying stuff they shouldn't say. They've lost all political correctness. They make racist jokes, gender jokes, sexist jokes, and we're laughing. <laughs> that's the worst thing. I'm laughing. Right? When Kevin Hart making sexist jokes, it makes me laugh. Okay, I'm not supposed to laugh, but I'm laughing, right? This is, and, and, at, and, and at the same time, the laughter kind of, it's kind of freeing. It gives a bit of oxygen. It makes us less, you know, sanctimonious. So Nietzsche is like that. Nietzsche is a stand-up comedian. He's going to say impossible things. He's going to be unpolitically correct. He's going to be outrageous. Uh, what's the other word? Um, it has an X in it. Um, oh, I can't find that word. You know when you're like, uh, obnoxious, that's it. Nietzsche is obnoxious, <laughs> right? He's in your face, obnoxious, outrageous, unpolitically correct, but he's funny, <laughs> right? He says it all with so much wit and finesse and uh, that, that you actually find yourself laughing and, and kind of, going along uh, on the ride, right? So, and it's very important to be able to go along on the ride because if you can't go along on the ride, you won't be able to really hear him and you won't be able to respond to him. The only reason I can respond to Nietzsche is that I love Nietzsche, right? That's the, the only people who can respond to Nietzsche in, with, in a serious way and really address some of the criticisms he's making and really bring a, a counter argument. You can only do that if you already love the person you're responding to. If you don't love them, you don't understand them. So you can't respond, right? To love is, is, is the only way to understand, right? Anything that you want to respond to, you first have to learn to love. This is a general philosophical rule. <laughs> if you want to respond to any philosopher, right? You have to first learn to love them and appreciate them. And then once you're really in their shoes, now you can respond in a way that they would hear you out. So because I love Nietzsche so much and I enjoy the ride and I'm laughing through the whole thing, that makes me, uh, that gives me the credentials <laughs> to be able to respond to him seriously. So if you really want to respond to Nietzsche and not just avoid Nietzsche and stay a baby spiritually, because that's what will happen. If you avoid Nietzsche, you stay a baby, <laughs> right? If you want to avoid that, you have to learn to love him. And for that, the only way is to develop a sense of humor. So go watch a few comic comedians first, right? Get used to it. Just start liking people like Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart, this guy. This, what's this other guy? This, this guy who's super anti-religious, this white guy. Very funny. Anybody know who he is? 
George Carlin. George Carlin. Yes, uh, I got it. <laughs> right, George, is that it? Okay, everybody, before you read Nietzsche, if you have a religious background, you first watch George Carlin, you like, you, you start to, you learn to like George Carlin, and then you'll be ready for Nietzsche, <laughs> right? He's exactly the same. It's exactly the same jokes. It's exactly the same worldview. I mean, I was on the floor with George Carlin um, when he was talking about, um, well, I'll, I won't ruin it. I, I don't do jokes very well. So I won't ruin it for you. Just go watch him. Um, so yeah, so that's the idea. You have to go see him like a stand-up comedian. You have to already appreciate, um, uh, have a sense of humor. Uh, and, and this is so important because if you cannot receive Nietzsche, Honestly, you cannot get to the next level spiritually. So you have to really learn to love him. And once you love him, then you have to begin to seriously respond. And in this class, we'll be doing that for the rest of the semester almost. I'll always be alluding back to Nietzsche and showing how Marcel and Levinas and even Simone Weil can offer a response because Nietzsche is really the pivot. He's just the, the stumbling block in philosophy. Um, uh, and, and he's, he's amazing. So first of all, right, number one, develop a sense of humor. Number two, you have to, so a lot of you, second objection you'll have, apart from him being obnoxious and, and, uh, and irreverent, <laughs> second objection I'm going to hear from you is that, ah, oh, he's not making any arguments. He's just saying stuff. There's no rigor. And that's true, right? Nietzsche doesn't make a single argument. He's just, you know, he's ranting. He's just ranting. He's like, the, have you ever seen these homeless guys? The older, old homeless people, you know, going around mumbling and, and it's like that, right? Except very intelligent. <laughs> so he's ranting, but he's not philosophizing, it seems, right? Except if you remember how Socrates used to philosophize. Anybody remember? Did, did Socrates offer arguments? How did Socrates philosophize? Anybody know? Did he write long treatises with arguments? No, it's just questions. He's always asking questions, right? Posing questions to people. And, the, and were the people happy with the questions? Did they enjoy Socrates? No, everybody got mad at him. Exactly. Yeah, Socrates was, he was a nuisance. He would go around making people feel like idiots, right? He would go around, ask questions innocently, and little by little, as he's asking the questions, he's dismantling you in front of everybody. You start to look stupider and stupider every single minute, right? There's a, there's a mathematical, mathematical formula, how every minute you become stupider with Socrates in, 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 in front of you. So this is the thing. Uh, and Nietzsche is proceeding in the same way. Nietzsche doesn't need arguments because his goal is not to tell you something. His goal is simply to make you feel uncomfortable with where you are right now. That's it, like Socrates. The only goal of Nietzsche is to make you feel uncomfortable where you are right now. Now, how is that healthy? How is that good? How is that not just pure destructive and negative? Why is it good what Nietzsche is doing? And Socrates, by the way. Uh, I feel like if you're, if you're comfortable where you're at, then you can't see any problems with it. Like if you find, if you find comfort in everything around you, you don't see, you don't see the problems with it. Exactly. And I, yeah, I feel like that kind of relates to today too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so yes, and Trujillo added to question ourselves. Right? You cannot grow if you feel like everything's fine. You can't mature. You can't get better. And so what Nietzsche is doing to us, especially if we have a religious background, right? he's making us feel stupid and uncomfortable, like we don't have it together. And we don't, <laughs> right? We think we do because we have elaborate churches and synagogues and, you know, pompous people making sermons. We think we got it together. But when you scratch a little, there's not much there. Right. And Nietzsche is, is pointing it out. He's like that boyfriend or girlfriend that, that is just like they get to that place that nobody knows except you and you want to hide it and they find it. Right. Um, so that's what Nietzsche does. Nietzsche is simply going to. He, he, he challenges us, he makes us uncomfortable, why? So that we can begin to respond and go deeper, right? Nietzsche is an invitation to go deeper. I don't take him as an invitation to reject, right? I take him as an invitation to go deeper in what I know and so that I can actually respond to him properly, right? So Nietzsche actually has helped me in my own spiritual journey to go deeper. I wouldn't have gone that deep if I hadn't seen Nietzsche, 
right? If I hadn't encountered Nietzsche. So, so that's the second thing. Yes, he doesn't make arguments, but that's not his goal. His goal is to simply ask the right questions and make you feel uncomfortable in your religious worldview so that you can begin to move like Maimonides uh, advised, right? To move forward. Right? We are all called in this class, every single writer we're going to see is an invitation to move forward, which means abandoning certain things, right? And so that's what Nietzsche is doing. So that's the other, right? There's two kinds of people who will be offended in, in, when they read Nietzsche, the religious people <laughs> and the philosophical people who have, you know, who want things to be nicely put, systematized and nice arguments, right? So he will, Nietzsche is, is, is going to obliterate both <laughs> he's like a bull in a china shop his goal is different his goal is simply to make us feel small so that we can begin to grow right but he does it very with a lot of refinement and a lot of uh, wit which helps the medicine grow down okay any questions on Nietzsche before uh, we conclude Oh, okay. Oh, some of you are upside down on the screen. It's funny. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to start. Uh, let me stop the recording.